Hello, in this video we are going to create a distortion patch using MaxMSP. Distortion is perhaps one of the most basic sound effects you can create and play around with, but it does contain a surprising amount of depth. When you look at the different algorithms and different approaches and the different amount of parameters you can play around with, you will discover that there are so many different sounds hidden in this basic effect. Using these ideas, you can create your own sound or play around with sounds in a very specific way to create a very specific tone. So let's see how this is done. If we are talking about distortion, we are talking about distorting the waveform in order to add more harmonics and more overtones and in general, more saturation. We want to do this to create cooler variations in our sound as we are working with it. And in order to do this, we have to consider two applications, two approaches. These are called hard clipping and soft clipping. There we go. And we are going to start with hard clipping, uh, but both of these think or run in the same manner. They are going to manipulate the incoming waveform based on its amplitude. Hard clipping, however, refers to what we normally think of distortion as its cause. Normally distortion happens if the sound is too loud, right? If the speakers or the headphone cannot really handle the loudness of the sound coming in, the sound itself starts to get a bit distorted. And we can try to recreate this in Max, uh, but we have to do this a bit carefully. If I actually play sounds that are too loud, well, first of all, you're going to stop watching this video because it's going to be too loud. But secondly, I might put my equipment and my ears in danger. So let's start doing this first uh, visually. Let's create cycle tilde and let's give it a frequency of one. So this is a sine wave oscillator with a frequency of one. And let's visualize this using live.scope. And if I turn on my audio, there we go. Beautiful sine wave or sinusoidal wave. Now, here is the trick in understanding distortion and actually a lot of things relating to digital signal processing. These guys here, these lines, the values contained within these lines are numbers. They represent the amplitude of the sound at that specific moment. And depending on what you are hearing, what you are listening, these variations happen so quickly that we don't really hear changes in variation, but we hear sound. We hear sound made up from different frequencies. And in digital systems, this is mostly represented by the, these values, these amplitude values, oscillating between minus one and plus one. If we go higher than this, we are going to cause distortion because one, the amplitude of one, the peak deviation of one, so one or minus one, is the loudest sound or computers or digital systems can create. This is what an amplitude of one means. If my amplitude is higher than one, I am asking my computer to play sounds louder than it physically is able to. Right, so think of these values, these lines, as, the, as lines values oscillating between minus one and plus one. All right, now, if I do want to distort this though, well, what I can do is I can multiply the signal, right? I can use multiplication tilde because I'm working with signals and I can type in something like 0.5. And if I multiply the signal by 0.5, well, I'm halving the values of the signal, right? Instead of going from minus one to one, it's going from minus 0.5 2.5, so essentially I'm going to hear a signal that perhaps is half as strong as the original signal. I can do it the other way around though. I can multiply the signal by two and look at what's going to happen. It looks like the waveform is distorted, right? Well, in fact, it is not distorted yet. And this is another important point with distortion. The distortion happens at the output. If I was a very bad person, and if I simply plugged this in the output, which is not what I'm going to do, I would hear a distorted sound, but that would happen as it is going through here, as my computer is physically trying to play the sound. In the computer's mind, so to speak, we are not really going to have any distortion with this signal. It does look distorted here because this object, live.scope, by default, we can check this through the inspector, is going to display values between minus one and plus one. And the inspector for this object, if we change the range to minus two to plus two, there we go. Now it looks like a regular sine wave again, but now 
they're kind of zooming out. So the values are a bit zoomed out. This actually goes from minus two to plus two. There we go. So what do we do if we want to safely distort this? Well, one choice, one option could be to clip this, right? Let me just fix this here. There we go, looks perfect. So one idea could be to clip this, right? So kind of tell the signal, well, if you're above one, just stay at one, do not continue further than one. And if you are lower than minus one, just stay at minus one, do not go lower than minus one. And we can do this quite literally through clipping, clip tilde, and then I can type in a minimum and a maximum value, like minus one and one. And if I put my signal through this guy, look at what's going to happen. Suddenly I'm going to receive this beautiful waveform. Look at how angular it is. Look at how, I, I don't know, crunchy it is. It looks crunchy. I don't know if it sounds crunchy. We are going to test it in a second, but this waveform is obviously different than our regular sine wave, right? And furthermore, this fixes the problem of amplitude since this waveform will never go higher than one, since it will never go lower than minus one, it will have a maximum peak amplitude of one. So now I can go back to the inspector if I want to, and I can fix the range. And now this waveform will never exceed down amplitude of one, but the waveform itself is distorted. Now let's actually try to hear this guy as we copy this entire algorithm. So let's copy it here. And I'm going to change the frequency of cycle to something like 220, so a low A note. And I am first uh, not going to do any kind of clipping, any kind of distortion. I will just put this through live.gain to be able to change its gain and then put it into my beautiful speakers. So this is the original sine wave that we all know and love. All right, sounds nice. And now let's actually put it through our distortion algorithm. Cycle goes here, multiplied by two, but then we clip any excess amplitude values. And what are we going to get? It sounds much harsher now. It does sound louder because there is more frequency content in it, but it will never ever exceed uh, the maximum possible amplitude without distortion. The distortion is done before everything is sent to our speakers. And if I want to play around with this distortion, I can change this multiplication value, right? Instead of multiplying it by two, I can create a float number box, put it into the second inlet of this multiplication object and start playing around with its values. It's kind of like mixing the, single, uh, the signal with a rectangular wave. And we can visualize this using a spectroscope, right? A spectrogram. I can just take this. I can take the spect uh, spectroscope. I can never spell that correctly. Spectroscope tilde object right here. And I can plug in my cycle. And well, this is the frequency content of my sine wave. It's not very impressive. But after it's distorted, we can look at the results. I can amp up the distortion a bit. And we see all these harmonics, all these overtones suddenly pop in adding richness and saturation to the tone. And this is what we are changing when we are amplifying the sound before it's clipped. We are adding more and more harmonics, stronger and stronger overtones, creating a nice sound. Now, I, I, as much as I love sine waves, I would like to try this with something else. So for instance, let's try Volking Bass. Right, a nice sample of walking bass. This is how it normally sounds. Pretty cool. And if we put this through our distortion algorithm, we are going to get something like this. Let's crank it up a bit. It's a bit more punchy, it's a bit more crunchy. It definitely sounds a bit more saturated, right? And the more I go, the more saturated it's going to be. It is never going to be too loud, right? Again, there isn't any concrete uh, possible problem with this kind of algorithm unless you go way too crazy. But just to be sure, before we send the audio to EasyDAC, we can always add a Lemmy tilde with the argument two to create a two-channel peak limiter. So if somehow we mess things up, 
we make sure that our ears are safe. There we go. Beautiful. What we have done up until this point was hard clipping. This is called hard clipping. Hard clipping is when you just amplify the amplitude and you clip the signal in order to change the waveform through changing the peaks of the sound itself. We have done this, it is complete, but now let's start thinking about soft clipping because this, in my opinion, is where things start getting really, really fun to play around with. Soft clipping both creates a more audible effect and a more subtle effect. It is going to not only change the peaks of the sound, the peaks of our sine wave, but also the intermediate values itself. Let me show you what I mean. If I take my cycle with a frequency of one, if I again create a live.scope to visualize a signal, I can make this even slower. I want to change the intermediate values as well as the peaks, as well as the lowest and highest values. I want to play around with the shape of this curve as well. I want to change the shape of this waveform so that I add some slight harmonic, some slight overtone, some slight saturation in the sound. And doing this is trickier than you think, because to do this you actually need to apply algorithms into the incoming sound beyond amplifying and clipping the sound itself. Now luckily there are a lot of papers and algorithms and even books about this subject, and for this video I want to look at this paper called Harmonic Instability of Digital Soft Clipping Algorithms by Sean Enderby and Zlatko Baratskai. I hope I'm pronouncing those names right. In any case, they have published this fantastic paper during the 15th International Conference on Digital Audio Effects in the ancient, ancient Stone Age year of 2012. Now, I don't want to go through the entire paper with you because that's actually part of what I do for a living, but I do want to look at section four, I believe, which was entitled, no, section three, which was entitled algorithms, because here some algorithms are described for, whoop, let's make it a bit larger. Some algorithms are described for soft clipping, right? Such as hyperbolic tangent soft clipping, sinusoidal soft clipping, exponential soft clipping, uh, cubic soft clipping, and so on and so on. So I want to take one or two of these algorithms, apply it to our audio signals and see which kind of distortion effects we are going to get through soft clipping. This is also a great exercise in taking these kinds of mathematical formulas and applying them into the world of coding such as Max MSP. Me being very lazy, I want to start with the hyperbolic tangent soft clipping, which is very easy. Y equals 10H of 5 times X. Well, there are three terms that might need explaining. Y is the output, right? That's going to be the resulting sound. The resulting sound equals this whole thing. Any sample, any point of information in our signal is going to be represented by this Y value as the output. The X is, well, the kind of the little brother, little sister, partner in crime, the Luigi to its Mario, it's the input, right? This is going to go in, X is going to go in, Y is going to go out. So I want to do the apply the hyperbolic tangent function on five times X, and that is going to be my output. Now, I don't really want to explain what a hyperbolic tangent function is. So is it arithmetic? Is it trigonometry? Is it Dragon Ball Z? Doesn't matter. All you need to know is that there is the object 10H tilde in Maximus B that lets you put in some kind of information and results in the, you know, the result of the function, the function with that input. So if I get 5x, x times 5, uh, through this object, I should have achieved hyperbolic tangent soft clipping. All right, well, that seems simple enough. So I can take my sine wave, right? Let's again create a copy of it here so we can visualize the results. We can compare them. Let's multiply the sine wave by 5. And then let's indeed get hyperbolic tangent of it. And there, it still looks like a sine wave, but notice how the intermediate values, the lines themselves, the slopes themselves are also distorted. This is not the same shape anymore. And we can make this even more obvious by choosing one of these, going to the inspector, choosing the background color, turning down the opacity, changing the waveform color to something other than the default orange, like this nice green color, and then overlaying these two guys. If necessary, right-clicking and choosing 
bring to front or send to back. There we go. And make sure these are all the same size. And I think you can see very easily that these two are not the same function. So we are really shaping the wave. Perhaps this can be also this can also be called wave shaping. I don't know. In any case, this is going to sound different than the original signal. And it is still a very simple algorithm by itself. So let's try doing this with our well first with our 220 hertz sine wave and then let's apply the results to our walking base. Now if we put our 220 hertz sine wave through this process we are going to hear something like this. Now, if you have good ears, you will notice that it does not sound as rough as the previous example. It does not sound as rough as the heart clipping example we did before. And if you have good eyes, you will notice while well, on the spectroscope, there are no very high harmonics. There are no very high overtones. The overtones are in the lower region. So it's the sound itself is a bit muted. It's a bit darker. It's a bit less crunchy, but it, it has a nice amount of saturation in it. This will become even more apparent if we add our walking bass example to the mix. Let's see. So, the walking bass will sound like this. Nice. And for comparison, this is how it normally sounded. completely different and also beautiful. Now, what I want to get your attention on is the fact that this five is just a number, right? This is a number we can change. This is a number we can treat as a coefficient. There is no one forbidding us from using another number instead of five to, you know, put into this algorithm and then see what pops out. There's only one thing you need to watch out for, which is the fact that if you mess around with these numbers, if you treat these as coefficients, it could be that the resulting sound might be louder than an amplitude amplitude of one. It might actually be distorted through your speakers, which is not what you want. So be sure that you have a peak limiter at the very end if you are going down this road of exploration. But just for experimentation purposes, let's see what happens if we use other values than five. So if I lower this, it sounds a bit better, it sounds a bit less distorted. And if I amp this up, predictably, look at this, I'm getting so many frequencies. It's such a beautiful, fat sound that we receive. And we can make this as high as we want. I don't think, thanks to Limit Tilde right here, it will never be too much. Cool. And finally, let's try one of the harder algorithms, right? Uh, because I can leave this here and I'm not going to do all of these algorithms. Of course, if you want to, you can. If you want further study, you can do these. But I just want to look at one of the more complex ones that uh, have these fours in there for some reason. Like, well, what does a four mean? So let's try, indeed, let, let's try cubic soft clipping. I don't think this is going to sound too different than our example, but it is going to sound different for sure. So what is going on in here? Well, it's the same kind of logic, right? Y equals sine of x for the absolute value of x larger than two divided by three. This is more or less an if statement, right? If we read this from right to left, which we always can if we are thinking in terms of code, this means that if the absolute value of x is larger than two divided by three. And if you don't know, absolute value is if you just take the negative part out. If it's a negative value, you just turn into a positive value. If it's a positive value, you don't touch it, and then you have the absolute value. So if we take the absolute value of the signal at that moment, and it is larger than 2 divided by 3, then y equals the sine of x. What is the sine of x? I'll get to that in a second. But for now, just it's something. It's a function. And if x is smaller than or equals to 2 divided by 3, and is larger than or equals to minus 2 divided by 3, instead of the sine of x, y is going to equal to this whole mess right here. Well, whatever this is, we are going to implement this in a second. Uh, but I just want to consider that. I think we only need to think about this very first one. I think if this one is not true, I, I think if the absolute value of x is not larger 
than 2 divided by 3. Well, it's going to be less than or equal to 2 divided, divided by 3, or it's going to be less than or equal to, or larger than or equal to minus 2 divided by 3. So we don't really need to check for this. If we check for this first statement here, we are good. So two things we have to figure out, well, actually two and a half things, we have to figure out how to work with these conditionals in the world of max MSP. We have to figure out whatever the sign function is, not sign, S-I-G-N, the sign function is of a value. And then we have to also figure out this exponentation here. So how do we get the third power of a value? So let's start with the if statements. There really is no if tilde object, right? I, there is no if tilde object. I think if you go into gen, you, you can implement these kinds of conditionals, but I'm going to try to steer clear of gen because this is supposed to be the basics of distortion. And I'm assuming anyone with max MSP without going into gen, anyone with a basic knowledge of max MSP can do this. So here is what I'm going to propose. I'm going to instead use the selector tilde object, which is going to assign one of the several inputs to an outlet, and I'm going to give it the argument two, right? And what this is going to do is, it's going to take in some kind of signal to its second inlet, it's going to take some kind of signal to its third inlet, and the value going into the first inlet will determine if the second or the third inlet is going to be sent out from the single outlet here. If the first inlet receives the value or signal with the value one, then the second inlet's contents will be sent through the outlet. If instead this guy, the first inlet receives a message or a signal with the value two, then the third inlet is going to be sent out from the only outlet. So we can create some kind of algorithm that decides if the absolute value of x is larger than two divided by three or not. So let's do that. Let's uh, again create a basic uh, cycle tilde one, just a basic sine wave, and let's get the absolute value of it using abs tilde, right? Fairly simple. And then let's check if this is larger than two divided by three. Now two divided by three, and I'm going to use a larger than tilde object here, and the argument is not going to be two divided by three. I don't think Max will understand this. No, it will give me an error and say, well, bad arguments creating objects, calling me a bad person and it's calling these arguments bad. But I know that two divided by three is 0 0.6666666666666666 and six until infinity, if I have that right. And I know if I create this, Max is just going to say, well, let's call this 0 0.6666667 so the CPU doesn't uh, get too frustrated about it. In any case, this is our control. Is the absolute value larger than two divided by three? And these comparison operators will always give us zero if this is false and one if this is true, right? Which is very close to what I want. If this is false, right? If this is false, I want to, let's say, have this outlet, right? I, I want to have this outlet. Uh, I mean, I want this inlet to go to this outlet. And if this is true, I want this inlet to go to this outlet. So if this is false, I want the first input to be sent true. And if this is true, I want the second input to be sent true. So instead of using values zero and one, I want to use the values one and two. So I can simply add one plus tilde one to the signal. And now if it is false, I'm going to get this being passed through. And if this is true, the last inlet here is going to be sent through right here. So good. So we have done this part. We have figured out uh, or conditional, which is good. But again, so what is the, si the sign function, S-I-G-N function? It's simple, actually, but it will be a bit tricky to implement it in max. Uh, the sign function is going to give us zero if x is zero. It's going to give us one if x is above zero, so if x is a positive number, and it is going to give us minus one if x is below zero, or if x is a negative number. Now, again, you might think, well, maybe there is a sign function, right? Uh, well, there isn't really, this object does not exist. And if you are a gen head, you might say, well, gen tilde has a sign function. I can always go into gen tilde, and I can create a nice sign function here, and I can work with this. In fact, you can do all of this in a gen slightly easier and with slightly better performance. But again, this is the basics of distortion. You can apply this to gen tilde uh, whenever you want to. 
during your own free time. I want to figure this out in MaxMSP. I want to figure this out using the rules of MaxMSP and here is what I'm going to do. I am going to create two comparison operators larger than zero and less than zero. And I, and I want these to work with signals, so I will say larger than tilde zero and less than tilde zero so that these work with signals. And I'm going to put this, my input signal, the signal to be distorted through both of these guys. And remember, these are comparison operators. They're going to give me zero or one. And I am going to then subtract the first one from the other one. And this should theoretically give me the sign of the incoming signal. And we can test this, right? I can create the sig tilde object, which is going to turn numbers into signals containing those numbers. So I can put in a float number here. To visualize the result as a number, I can also create the number tilde object. So I can do it like this. And let's see, okay, if this is zero, we get zero. If this is 20, 225, we get one. If this is minus 225.222, we get minus one, right? So this is our sine function. Sine function, very cool, because it really is very cool. So how does this work? Well, long story short, if or number is zero, let's see. If our number is zero, is zero larger than zero? No. Is zero less than zero? No. So we get zero minus zero equals zero. If our number is something like 55, if it's a positive number, is it larger than zero? Yes. Is it less than zero? No. So we get one minus zero, which is one. And if it's minus 222, is it larger than zero? No. Is it less than zero? Yes. So zero minus one is minus one. There you go. Our sine function, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we have that done, right? And we know that if or if statement is correct, if or uh, check is correct, if the absolute value of x is larger than two divided by three, then we want this value to be passed through. But now we have to deal with this beast here. And I think it's going to be easy once we figure out how to get x to the power of three. And here is how I do it. Here is how I would do something like that. Let me clean my max console real quick. So. Here is my trick for this multiplication tilde and I'm going to take my input signal and I'm going to multiply it against itself, which is raising it to a power of two, right? This is X times X. I will then take the result and not multiply it by itself, but instead multiply it by again, the input signal, right? So this is X times X and the result times X, X times X times X, X to the power of three. All right, very cool, but there's this whole other mathematical gibberish here. So again, let's start from the right side. I always prefer to start from the right side. It's usually easier to turn it into code if you are looking at a mathematical formula and you are starting from the very end. So 27 times x to the power of 3 divided by 16. All right, well, we have x to the power of 3. Let's multiply this by 27 and let's divide the results by 16. Notice that again, these are all numbers, right? So we can treat these as, whoops, forgot the tilde here. We can treat these as coefficients later if we want to, to get some more parameters in our function. Just creating more space because after this, we do have to uh, also get x nine x, x times nine divided by four, right? So I'm going to create times nine, x times nine divided by four. All right, and then this minus the whole previous thing we have done. So I'm going to create a minus operator minus tilde, right? So x9 divided by 4 minus 27 times x to the power of 3 divided by 16. And this is what I want to have if the absolute value of x is not larger than 2 divided by 3. Oof, there it is. So this seems to be our algorithm, right? And I don't think it looks that scary. I think if you know what is going on, if you're okay with what's going on, this is the same thing as this. And you can easily work with an algorithm like this in MaxMSP as well. So let's see what it looks like before we hear what it sounds like. So here is the inputs, cycle one, and here is the output. 
And again, let's put the output on the bottom. You can see once again that the shape is slightly different. You might even think, well, this looks more or less like the hyperbolic tangent soft clipping. Not exactly, it is slightly different, so it is going to re result in slightly different harmonics and overtones. We can even overlap this again. Let's change the background color, the waveform color. There we go. Let's put this here. And again, you can see how the waveform is different in a different way thanks to this new algorithm, the cubic soft clipping we have implemented. All right, this is all cool and all, but how does it sound? So let's do our thing again. Let's uh, take the result of this. Let's take our spectroscope tilde objects, right? Let's delete all of these. And let's change the frequency of our main signal to 220 once again. Nice A. And this is the result. And you can already see it looks slightly different. Let's see how it sounds. There we go. Again, it's not too bad. It's not too harsh. It's a bit soft, yet it is saturated just enough. And if you remember the, uh, the frequency content of our previous soft clipping function, it did not really have all of these tiny overtones on the higher frequency. So it does sound different thanks to this. This is a small difference, but if your ears are really attuned to sound, to really to music, and if you're using that sensitivity to do something creative, you will definitely use this for certain purposes. And finally, let's do the same thing with our Volking bass example. Nice, and while this is looping, now we can start playing around with these coefficients, right? So what if I multiply this by something other than nine? Let's see. If I lower this value, well, not much seems to happen. If I raise this, it does get a bit louder itself. All right, well, what if I play around with this 27? Again, just slight differences in the sounds. I can play around with this divide by 16. Play around with this divide by four. Well, and I'm, see, I'm breaking things now. I am breaking things. It's a good thing I have Lemmy here. So do use caution when you do things like this. And finally, let's also play around with this larger than two divided by three value. Whoa, all right, there we go. And this is where things get crazy. Look at this. Beautiful. So the lower this value is, the more noise it lets through, the more sensitive it, it is to letting through noise. And the larger it is, the more and more okay it is with not letting noise through. There we go. Beautiful. So as you can see, you can use all of these parameters to really customize your soft clipping function. And these do result in unique sounds, unique combinations of timbre, unique combinations of harmonics and overtones and saturation in your sound. So I hope you have a lot of fun playing with it. I hope you have a lot of fun creating new things, creating new sounds and new music. And thank you for watching.